Robo House Reads. You're listening to the If You Would Use This series that is based on the observation that inventions are often used in ways that are far from what the original inventors envisioned in their labs. So why not learn from this phenomenon and take early stage robotic inventions from their lab to a randomly selected workplace and then see what happens. With me here today is Fede de Gefte, author of four If You Would Use This stories so far. and She's going to read her piece on the swarms of cheap robotic rovers of Lunar Zebro, an ambitious project to democratize space exploration. Faye, so before we go into this, before you read the art- article, um, can you describe these little zebra robots for us? What do they look like? Um, if you first see them, I think you're really reminded of lunchboxes. So when you were little and you uh, got your sandwiches uh, from your mom and got to take them to school, you had these uh, yeah, plastic, colorful boxes. Um and that's where they build their zebras in. So they add C-shaped legs to the side to make them walk. But for the for the remaining design, it's uh, all integrated into a pretty square, uh, colorful box. And um, who makes these robots and, and why do they exist? Um, I've met the people that made them. And if I can describe them, they're very passionate uh, young students. Um, Together with, I've met one professor, but I think there are more. Um, And I I believe they make them because they truly want to learn from all different kinds of technology. So they've had, they've, they have this one vision to put their zebra on, on, on the moon. But to get there, they take the best things of all different kinds of innovations in Delft and in the rest of the world uh, and combine them uh, into one lunchbox. (laughs) And um, tell us a bit more about the if you would use this process. So um, how did you select a workplace to bring these little robots that look like lunchboxes uh, two, uh, and and why did you uh, select the person that that we also see in the story? Yeah, so maybe to start from the beginning, we start by unraveling the the core concept of of what we're what we're describing in the article. So, for this, I wanted to really learn what the lunar zebras were all about. So, um, what the heart of the innovation was. And for that, I did uh, an interview with uh, Cornel and Peter. uh, And together, we kind of came to the conclusion that it was all about democratizing democratizing space exploration. Um, And then the hard part comes. You have to detach from everything you learn and try to go to a random workplace because in, as, as, as you've, described in the introduction, it's never fully clear where an innovation ends up and what is going to happen with um, with the invention people make. So to get it as accurate as possible, we try to make it as random as possible. So uh, we found this um, randomizer online where you um, m- put in a list of all the things you want to choose between. And my uh, my colleague Luca has a ha made a pretty list, um, a very long one with all kinds of random occupations. Um, we've put them in, and during one of our stand up meetings online, we um, we spin the wheel quite uh, quite literally, and um, yeah, the wallpaper hanger designer came out of that. Um, the wallpaper hanger designer. The wallpaper. Was, was that actually in the list? <laughs> I'm not sure what the actual name was. The yeah, wallpaper. I think it was a, because it's in Dutch probably, right? Yeah. So it was behanger. Behanger, yeah. Hanger. <laughs> okay, so then you had the, the wallpaper hanger. Mm-hmm. And and what then? What, what did you do then? Um, well, it, it came out of the randomizer with, with some confetti and then we were sitting with the four of us in a Zoom room, so... Um, Luca, me, Joost and Bas and we were kind of looking at each other like who knows who knows someone who does this and then uh, you you uh, told us you, kn- you knew a really um, 
enthusiastic young woman that uh, hanged a wallpaper with you and you and your wife were really happy with uh, with uh, with the communication and with the result and with how how lively she was and you thought it would be great to listen to her about what her ideas were on uh, yeah on these innovations so it was you <laughs> <laughs> so it was me I, so i asked the question but i already knew right yeah um, <laughs> Okay, so so uh, you got Selma's name, and and what then? What happened then? Well, at first, I send um, I send a WhatsApp message just to let her know that I got her number. So I was I, I introduced myself, asking if I could call. So I I, f- I feel a little bit um, yeah. How do you say that? I I don't think it's nice to contact people if they're not sure who you are. I'm not sure if that's, that's something my generation has or that's just um, everyone, but I, I wanted to let her know I would call. So um, I asked her if it was okay if we called and then she said yes. And we had a, a lovely uh, lovely first um, short talk about the idea to propose some technology to her and then she would, she would um, yeah, get some ideas on that uh, and she thought it was nice so we set up a real zoom meeting and in that in that in that um, video meeting we um, went through the entire process and what struck you most about how Selma responded to the little robots and and also about her ideas well the most funny part was that she um, when we started the Zoom meeting, she couldn't get online. So it took her a while to to start the meeting and to, to get her screen to work. And I think her husband or, or someone, uh, her partner or friend, uh, helped her to get her online. So they, she set up everything um, with, some, uh, with some hassle. And her first wor- words to me were, I hate technology. <laughs> so <laughs> when we started our, our conversation, it was um, quite unfriendly towards everything that had buttons or screens. Uh, and from there, she she opened up. So it was a kind of defensive mode. But when we we started getting ideas about the robots and if she uh, when she saw how how they were how they were made in these colorful colorful little boxes and, and what she could do with it, that she could have ownership of one of these boxes, then it all uh, it all went off and, and she described them also uh, as friendly little helpers. So that was a cool change. And what did you notice about yourself when you found yourself talking about the robots, explaining what they were and what, what they do to, to Selma? Did you notice that you said anything or emphasized anything different differently because you were talking to a wallpaper hanger or someone who's not a robotics expert or an engineer such as yourself yeah that's a, that's a good question i think when you start off explaining you kind of try to explain the purpose so why does it exist but when you when you want to go into that creative mo- mode of the ideas you you just describe the functions and how she could, how she could use it, was completely open, and then and then you make these functional remarks that seem kind of simple for for an engineer or for for someone that that's in innovation, but actually explain a lot more about the product than when you try to describe the purpose. And which which functions so, or in simpler language, you were you were going, you were telling her basically what what can this do, what is it capable of, what can it do, yeah, and what kind of things th- did you tell her? Well, we started off by having the the anal- analyze, analyzation analyzing. The the things they could analyze with. So the kind of cameras and the kind of sensors that they have, because she immediately immediately thought about okay but how can it how can it move so we talked about the cameras that it had uh, two cameras and that it could uh, see the environment and then um she wanted it to move so i was like yeah it can move it has these 
these weird weird legs uh, which i originally when i when i wrote the interview i thought okay i will describe them as c c shaped legs and uh, they can go over all kind of things because they have these c shapes but eventually i think it was more yeah it's weird but it works <laughs> and then for the rest she was like okay i trust it as long as it can climb and 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 go over things and and move rapidly then it's fine i don't care what kind of shape it has so um okay then and then selma came up with with several ideas w which people will read uh, and hear uh, in the story yeah um so we'll s we won't be talking about these ideas but when you showed the story to the lunar zebra team again right um what what was their response did did you feel that they learned anything from it or did they just um you know treat it as a a nice little story i i remember when tell when when, I, when we were telling about selma so me and luca went to the team and we, we were sitting in this big circle because of social distancing and uh, i told them about selma and i think I'm not sure, but uh, I think at first I got a little bit of a defensive feeling, like, uh, but we've we've spent six years for some for making something that is supposed to walk on the moon, and now you're telling us that she's gonna step on it. Um, so at first it was a little bit silent, um, but then from the back of the room, um, somebody I think somebody was listening that wasn't really <laughs> part of the meeting, but from the back of the room I I. There was someone who started to mingle in the in the in the conversation, and he was, I think he understood the the, the concept right away. So he said, like, uh, I'm not sure what his exact words were, but he started giving all kinds of insights about how they could never predict what the innovation was actually going to be used for, but that it was important to keep an open mind and to keep looking for the the use of the things they were developing. Um, and the audience was still quiet, <laughs> but I think now in a little bit more hopeful and understanding way. So it takes some time. Th these things take some time yeah, to and kind also of settle. Yeah, and also it takes breaking down some some walls. So, so of course, I understand this... As, as a designer, you also have these kind of babies. Your ideas are your babies. And if somebody steps on them, you're like, you're you're not amused. <laughs> but it, it takes some guts and it takes some time to, to let go of that original um, purpose and still work hard on making your innovation come, come to life. So as a final question, w w uh, you're a designer and engineer yourself, uh, as I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. What is your personal take out from this from this story? Yeah, um, it's it's difficult because as 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 we've just talked about uh, allowing your babies to or your ideas or your innovations to to grow towards their purpose instead of us pushing them down people's throat as something that we thought it was useful for. That's something I, I should be taking into account when when doing my projects, but I, I still don't. <laughs> I know it, but it's still something that's more about feeling. Uh, and that, yeah, as I just said, it takes some time to let, let, it, let it grow or go. But is that possible at all? Is it possible to design for the moon and at the same time think, well, maybe someone is going to step on it and use this as a robotic scaffolding. Uh, so I need, I need to design it in such a way that a, a, a woman uh, of 60 kilos can stand on it, right? Is that, is that possible at all that you think with both, uh, with both ideas in your, in your mind? I'm not sure. I think that the most important thing for that is not that you design per se for that for for the for planet Earth, but that you keep designing for the moon, but that you're proud of what you're doing nonetheless. So if if you if you don't land on the moon, but if you make 10,000 jobs easier, 
then you should also be proud, even if it's not the way you planned it to be. Because, yeah, how it's used is not something that defines your success. I think. It's not It's not how it's used um, according to plan, but if it's used at all, yeah. then you should be happy. Yeah, yeah. If you <laughs> if you make something better, or someone's life better, and I think you can even be m- maybe even more proud if y- your innovation was so, or your invention was so open or so well designed that that it can be adapted to someone else's needs. Thank you very much. Um, So here we go. Robohouse reads, um, the headline of this article is Moon Explorations. What if you would use this? Lunar Zebro is an ambitious project to send cheap rovers to the moon. It could democratize space exploration. But suppose we send these sturdy little robots into the world of interior decoration. In this series, we take robot inventions from their test lab and bring them to a randomly selected workplace in the outside world. This time, we find that lunar zebra robots are not just handy in outer space. They could also ease the life of hard-pressed handy persons here on planet Earth. Shoot for the Moon is taken quite literally by this team of students and professors from the TU Delft. We want to make the exploration of the Moon available for a wider audience, says Peter van Sandvliet partnership coordinator at Lunar Zebro. So we built the world's smallest and lightest l- rover. And what is the key to making a robust space vehicle as simple and cheap as possible? Cornel Somers, the team's content creator, says, the key is to not focus on one thing, but to create an entire system of collaborations. Genius steals, and this project is always looking for existing robotic innovations to combine and improve upon. Zebra's distinctive seed-shaped legs were sourced in this way. These plastic half-circles rotate over the highest point in the sea, enabling the robot to take little steps on uneven terrain. The lunar Zebra legs, legs team coordinates these six identical parts with a special algorithm, resulting in a walking motion. Other teams are Team Thermal, Team Body, Team Power, and so on. The power of the concept manifests itself through the collective. Individually, the rovers have a simple design and are highly customizable. But collectively, they can, in theory, accomplish accomplish complex tasks. Zebras can work in a swarm, each robot making autonomous, spur-of-the-moment decisions, while the collective is achieving a common goal. And because they are cheap, losing one robot is not the end of the mission. Current space missions are expensive and therefore highly focused. Affordable robots could open up moon exploration to a much wider range of research projects. Imagine we let rovers swarm the moon's far side, the quietest radio location near Earth, to look for cosmic signals from intelligent life. Also, the extremely harsh conditions on the moon challenges the lunar zebra students to become exceptional engineers. But we are also curious what the zebras may do on planet Earth. Like all inventions, they will surely pop up in unexpected places. To catch a glimpse of a possible future, we ask a professional dec- decorator. What would happen if you would use this? Meet Selma van Gent, an inspiring professional who works as a decorator and interior designer. Which means she builds the course, is trained in decorative painting and is an expert in hanging wallpaper. She first tells us she is anti-computer and actually anti-anything technological. But then she sees the zebras and starts exploring the possibilities of these little machines and her ideas keep flowing. Mapping the building site. When I build something on site, I have to take into account everything about the entire space, she explains. I have to measure distances and corners, estimate where s- what sound does, how high things can be, Sometimes I get bogged down in details. With a legion of zebras at her command, Selma could just send them out to map the physical dimensions of the place while she looks at the overall picture. Intelligent robotic scaffolding. When she does the paper hanging, Selma usually needs a structure to stand on. This scaffolding must be sturdy and safe, but also perfectly tailored so every wall is within reach. 
It often takes endless tinkering just to get it right. If zebra rovers would be strong enough and able to crawl on top of each other and interlock, a swarm of zebras could be a wonderful self-constructing self scaffold, says Selma. If they can analyze the required heights and combine these with my preferences, they could make the entire structure without me. That would be such a relief. Always bring me the right tools for the job. Our handy woman can do all kinds of jobs, and she is blessed with all kinds of tools. Sometimes this blessing becomes a curse. When Selma is painting on Tuesday and on Wednesday hanging wallpaper and making t props on Thursday, there are so many changes that she doesn't always have the right tools in her van. I would tell the rovers what job I had today and they would know which tools I would need, she's, she says. And they would stock the van for me and then always bring the right tools for the job. This would save a lot of headspace and allow Selma to focus on what she likes to do most. These cheap robots are now made to explore the moon and withstand the harsh environments of space. But who knows what the future holds? Maybe they will eventually land here on planet Earth, in the creative spaces of professional decoration. <laughs>